Hi, welcome to this week's edition of Bootstock. Again, John, Dave, and myself. We're going to look back over Ireland's uh, emphatic victory against South Africa, our uh, return to 1997 against uh, New Zealand A, all the other autumn international matches, and look forward to our game at the weekend against Fiji. So, lads, I suppose um, we talk about the big one first uh, Ireland beating South Africa in 1916. Seriously intense game. Um, ferocious uh, tackling um, and a great victory in the end. Absolutely. Uh, I think it was a, re- a really good entertaining game to watch. I, I suspect it was it was as a neutral, although I, I don't know what that was like because I definitely wasn't a neutral, but I think it was an entertaining game for the neutrals and uh, it was a real hard test match. One of those no quarter given, and you know when you saw the quality of the players, they the forwards anyway they had on on, on their and six of them on the bench. I was a bit worried now to be honest with you, but we stood up to them, uh, and Lou Diego went off uh, fairly early. Lucky for us, we lost a couple ourselves, uh, and you know, thing we we uh, things worked out reasonably well for us. Uh, they could have had a guy red carded in another universe maybe uh, but they got a yellow anyway uh, so that would have really taken the steam out of them and I'm kind of glad in a way that it wasn't a red because they, they, they don't have as much to whinge about I hear Razzie got a few whinges in anyway just for the crack but I, I think the, the I don't think the ref did particularly either side any major favours uh, home side usually gets a bit of a rub of the green uh, maybe we did slightly but they got penalised and they got off with a, a potentially higher card. So, yeah, good game, job done. Uh, the the lads sent back to South Africa with their tail maybe not between their legs, but uh, firmly, uh, you know, they've been put in their place firmly anyway and emphatically. And uh, we'll see how see if that does us any good in ten months' time when we come to the World Cup. But uh, I think it's better to have won it than to have lost it. it certainly is. I mean, the the physicality of that game was was off the charts and I mean we like we were speaking in our um in our build up last week and it, by the way it's good to see the Perry back back talking again you know I'm glad we got it all sorted out in the WRC um uh, but uh we we spoke about it last week how you know South Africa would want to bring rel- relentless physicality and they'd bring guys off the bench and all the stuff we know about South Africa but that didn't work um it's only when they started to play a more expansive game that they you know, really started to make some inroads against us. Um, the bomb squad were diffused by, you know, uh, Jason's favorite prop. Uh, I, I think Jason, Jason now has to do a, a mea culpa on Finley Bealham. Well, I just, can I just, I, I would agree he had a very good game and he's definitely improved over the last uh, 18 months. 100% agree with that. However, I would say that there was a few um, decisions that I was surprised that the referee gave in our favor. And I think the only reason that he did give them was that Porter had such a strong game. And if you actually look at those, those there was one scrum that was right in front of where I was sitting. Our, our scrum, now the South African scrum tried to wheel it, but it, it, it was exaggerated because Porter stood his ground and was able to stand his ground. But Bielan was going around at a rate of knots. And like I think we were very fortunate in some of those decisions. Um, I, I think the South African pack were trying to do. I, I, I'm not sure why they were doing it because, you know, you think if they scr- scrummaged straight and steady, they'd they'd still have an advantage. But they were doing the, a couple of times in the second half. A lot of the ones that got penalised, they were doing that step and step and sho- shove thing. That you know yeah. that sideways shift and shove, and it was a stupid thing to do, especially with a Georgian ref. I mean, do they honestly think that a Georgian hasn't seen that a million times in his entire rugby watching career? Um, so you know they were they, they were well diffused. Um, as you say, look in every 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 single rugby match, every single match I've ever seen, the team that wins, indeed, sometimes the team that loses, they always have a bit of luck. You need a bit of luck to win a match. Um, we 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 had one or two little pieces. South Africa had one or two little pieces, like you say. I mean, that yellow card could have very easily been a red card. Um, so the, we we could have had a yellow card. Like when Matt, Matt Hansen went to make a kind of a yeah you know, yeah that kind of intercept it, yeah but, but like that was he could easily have been ruled against him and him, him showing the yellow there like and I I don't know whether he was smiling at that incident but the camera focused on him just shortly after 
and he kind of had a little smirk on his face. You know what I mean? Like it looked like he. I think he was thinking I got away with that one. Yes, I, I believe that's what's called a bashful grin. Um, mm. But yeah, and and and, and you're one hundred percent right there. Um, I mean, I mean, people have tried to pretend that 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 uh, Dan Sheehan accidentally kicked the ball out of the rook. Me arse. Uh, but that's good play. You know, I, I mean, basically, what it comes down to anything's anything that you get away with is legal. You know, so. <laughs> Exactly. And that's and, and that's what that's what you have to do against these teams against the the okay. very sorry, just, just just to finish up the very best teams are always 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 pushing the the boundaries or the envelope of what's you know that line between what a ref will allow you to do and what a ref won't allow you to do, and South Africa do it, Ireland do it, France do, does it, Leinster do it, uh, La Rochelle do it. The best teams do that. They generally go. Like, like, what could Richie McCaw get away with? And work yeah. backwards from there. <laughs> Sorry, and he he no, he, and he won two World Cups. But like, like just that incident that Razzy highlighted about him, she and kicking the ball through. Yes, he did. But if you look at that at the exact same moment as he was kicking the ball through, oh, yeah. see was high tackling him and neck rolling him. Now that could have been a penalty to to Ireland, but it, the referee didn't deem it to be so. So be yes, you move on. You know what I mean? It's to the next. Yes. And it, it, and if the referee had looked at that, it would have been a penalty to Ireland because uh, foul play takes precedence. A foul play penalty takes precedence over a technical penalty. That's those are the laws of the game. So it would have been a penalty to Ireland. So I don't know. I mean, he, but that's you know sometimes you get that little bit of luck. You ride it, but it, then what we did was we took that little bit of luck and we converted it into really good rugby. Um, yeah. And that that try by Mac Hansen was an absolutely superb try. It really, really was. Great hands from all the players involved. Great reading of the situation from Doris to pick up the ball and then offload it before he got driven into touch. Um, great play by um, uh, Gibson Park to make the break. Good hands from t- from Byrne to get the ball out of the tackle. Uh, Jimmy O'Brien committing the man before passing it to, to give Hansen a run. And everything about it was showed a team that knew exactly what it was doing and knew how to do it, knew how to do it well. Absolutely. The other thing I was really impressed with was uh, our mall defence. Yeah. We seem to have the mall defence down. I was, and again, I was fearful that once they got that mall, ro- mall rolling, it's very little you can do when a team gets a mall rolling against you. Um, all you can do is concede a penalty, you know, which ultimately leads to cards, et cetera, et cetera. And once they start in on that thing, I mean, Munster used to do it back in the day. Once they, they know they have you in the corner, they just keep going back there and they keep going back there. Every time they went there, we had their number. And don't ask me what exactly we did, <laughs> the technicalities of it, but we seem to really be able to hold them in the ball. Uh, okay. And that took the wind out of their sails, I would say, I would suggest to some degree. Um, yeah. but it was clever, but they were so clever at how they did it. Like if you think of the, the line out defense that we were at the mall defense from the line out, and then just before half time, they had a line out on our line and we actually competed and we won it because we had sucker punched them into thinking we're staying on the ground, you know, that they don't necessarily have to have the best throw or the most accurate throw because we're not going to compete. And um, I, I think it was Ryan went up and won it, you know. So, like, we kind of, we had taught them on the pitch, by the, just in that in that facet of the play. Um and like exactly as you said, Dave, when when O'Brien came on, like he straightened up the line beautifully. Like he drew in the man because there's a, a natural tendency to drift across and to squeeze the space in the corner. But he straightened. He actually you could see him. He stepped back inside, drew the man, and gave the pass. And so Mac Hansen went in pretty much untouched. Like it was it's, it's... just very clever play. Yeah, no, and, and and I mean, we're talking about elements like of, of, of people doing the right thing. I mean, one of the things was, I mean, it was kind of fortunate that he was on the pitch. Like we're talking about the, like the situation you're talking about, Jason, where we won the South African ball on our, li- uh, on our line. Having a left-footed kicker there made the clearance so much easier. Yeah. So having Jimmy O'Brien there, and Jimmy O'Brien was really, really, I, 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 thought, he, I thought he played really, really well in, in his debut test against the world champions. Um. I don't think he did anything wrong at all. Like he literally got everything right. Yeah. One yeah, person did. that I take one, John. Well, all I was gonna say he's he's developed into a cracking player out of nowhere. Yeah, like yeah. he kind of he scored those four tries against Bath last season out of nowhere. 
and you know ever since then <clears throat> i suppose he's been on everybody's radar um and he's our, really, our, con our conveyor belt just keeps rolling on doesn't it like he's really mature. as you say as you say out of nowhere another one comes off the, the you know just to slash seems I, I i do want to say i mean I, I do want to say, I mean, we, 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 as you say, they, they kind of come to prominence very suddenly, but they, they don't come out of nowhere. No, um, no, that's fair enough. They come through a, a really great system that's, that constantly produces these players. And I, 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 know, I know you weren't been dismissive, but I just want to emphasize that. He came through really good system of age grade and schools rugby, really good system of youth rugby, um, or the, the, the age grade representative rugby into the Irish uh, representative sides played sevens for a bit I mean he came through all those levels that produce that bring players so that they can come from nowhere if you know what I mean on that big day I mean I'm certain that Bath had no video on him but at the same time he'd been in the Leinster system for 15 years or whatever even yeah. seventy, even sevens couldn't ruin him for you Dave yeah even sevens couldn't ruin him <laughs> I, I'll tell you one thing it's all the Gaelic football they play <laughs> in New Zealand <laughs> yeah, but one person I thought that made the most significant contribution to the game was Gibson Park's introduction. Mm. I mean, I just like not that Murray had a had a bad game or anything, but just the pace that Gibson Park brings to the game, you know, like he's yep. um it just was eye-opening the difference in the in those opening 10 minutes in the second half when he was on the pitch. And maybe who knows? Maybe they would have played the same way if if um, Murray was on. I don't know, but and it, 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 it's it's not even just about pace. It's about the application of pace at the correct time. Um, the way he does it, the way he changes, the, he manipulates the tempo. I'm not like look. I'm a huge Conor Murray fan. I think he's I, I I think he's been one of Ireland's greatest ever scrum halves. Um, he's changed the way the scrum half position is 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 viewed in Ireland, but. Gibson Park is, is is unquestionably and by some considerable distance uh, the best scrum half in the country now, um, and what I that's what I really like about him. It's not just the pace; it's when he chooses to apply the pace to apply that pace. He always seems to pick the right moment. Yeah, he changes the tempo in a way that causes maximum damage to the opposition and maximum benefit to the, to to our team. I suspect yeah. he came on bit, at least ten or fifteen minutes earlier than he'd planned to because because of Murray's injury. Um, but you know he seemed in good fettle. Uh, will Will he get another game next week to keep him taking over, or will he be uh, reserved for for Australia? Is uh, something we'll we'll see soon enough tomorrow. Considering actually, the team will be named. Considering hmm? he hadn't he hadn't played in. Uh... You know the entire season. That season. Hadn't played since the the tests then in in New Zealand. So, like that's when back in July was it? So it's a good few months ago, and um, to come back in to a game of that intensity and to make the difference that he did is, I think, quite remarkable. And one other guy that I thought was was very, even though he was only on for um, a brief twenty or so minutes, was McCluskey. I thought he had a very good game and. Surprised me. One, one, one moment within the game where the ball spilt and he did remarkably well to stay in his feet, jink around four or five uh, attackers, and um, you know, make sure that he that we were we managed to, to clean up that situation. Otherwise, there was no one at home. Um, you know, if, if he had, if yeah. he had gone to ground, we, they would have got the ball and and, and streaked home because everyone was. Head of the head of the head of the ball. Uh, yeah, I, I mean it's very unfortunate for the guy. He, I mean, he played probably the best twenty minutes of rugby I've ever seen him play, um, and he just got unlucky with the injury. He was having a really, really fine game. He was yeah. sick, and, oh. you could see as well. He was sick and sick. Yeah, oh, got it, got it. But what, what, one thing I do have to say is um, uh, how impressed I was just with the with with Gary Ringrose. Um, oh, yeah, Absolutely. shifted into inside centre. Um, and then at that pe that period of time in the run up to um, in the build up to the uh, first try, when Johnny Sexton was down receiving attention, Ringrose went into first receiver without missing a beat. Uh -huh. Yeah, yeah, no, that and that particularly in that play, there was a few of them stepped into first receiver. Yeah, and everybody wanted to get involved. You know, there was it didn't matter what number was on your back; it was you just slot in, and it was. Like going back to the Joe Schmidt days of 
you're just a cog in a, in a machine, you know, and everyone knows the, the role to, to play. Like even like when O'Brien came on, I'm sure he wasn't expecting to obviously get whatever it was, 60 minutes, and maybe not even in in the, the centre, you know? Yeah. Mm. So like he was uh, seeing the season. Like I just think that, I mean, we, we speak practically every week we've spoken about Van de Fleer and his performance is like once again off the charts um, you know so just you just have to wonder how he's keep how he keeps doing it yeah hey, everybody wants to have video on that guy for by, at this stage and they, they know what's coming and they're still not st- you know well in, in fairness a lot big part of his game is stopping other people which he's yeah. excellent at um, but you know we've, we've remarked many times and pretty much everybody you speak to remarks on how is is carrying improved uh, and whatever funky shit they do with their feet in contact in Leinster, I don't know what it is, but they all seem to be able to make those Gordon Darcy yards nowadays. Uh, it's not just uh, mm. Gordon Darcy with his low centre of gravity, etc. It's uh, it's it's everyone in the Leinster system, and the back rowers seem to. Conan's great at it. Doris is a master. He can. He just yeah. seems to get extra yards in contact that that nobody else would. You know. Uh, and yeah. and now Van der Fleer can do it as well. It's whatever whatever they're feeding them or teaching them, it's great. <laughs> yeah, it's obviously but, something very technical, you know, that they're they're doing with their feet in contact. And you know, I'm sure there's there's science behind it all, but above our pay grade, lads. Exactly. <laughs> but like one thing that that um, was obviously played into our hands was South Africa's kicking. Like it was some of the worst kicking I've seen at that mm. level that you'd expect from, you know, the world champions because they put balls straight into touch. They missed touch. They had penalty misses that really you'd expect them to get. And even at the very end, when when they scored the try in the corner, they had an opportunity to go a bit further in behind the posts. But he took the conversion right from about him, from like it was right in front of where I was sitting where he took the conversion from and you know he took it almost a foot say away from the, the actual touch line whereas the guy dotted it down about two meters infield so he made the angle even harder for himself now he was trying to rush and get the, the kick over i appreciate that but you know it's it's in these very very high intensity moments that you have to have a very cool head to not panic and to make sure that you kick the ball from the right place so that you give yourself every opportunity to get the, the two point conversion. Sure. Uh, I think we, I think another thing about South Africa that you can exploit is uh, their, if you take away their confidence to, is it like they just want to beat you up. They love beating you up and they love being the macho man and being able to kick the living shit out of you. They kind of nearly just give you the ball back just so they can tackle you again and crease you. It's like they're, and if if they don't have that free reign to just blitz you, it seems to upset them, you know. And like you said earlier, Jason, it's how you get around it is thinking. You think your way around them because it's it's easy to use that against. Well, it's not easy, but it is possible to use that against them. Uh, and and you know you don't have to hold them out for eighty minutes. You only have to hold them out at crucial times. And when you do it, it really puts a dent in their in their in their psyche. Uh, and I think you know that's that's something we also we've also done now with this with this victory. Hopefully, well, that, that's a, that that's a good point. It 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 it, it, it almost. It, I, I don't know if you remember, John. You used to use the phrase "hammer the hammer." Um, well, I didn't invent it. <laughs> yeah, we used to use it a lot about how Joe Schmidt's teams would would, would attack opposition where they thought they were strongest. Um, and, and like in a way, the game was there was an element of game of two halves about it. In the first half, South Africa were coming at us with all their physicality, and we were defending against them and driving them back with all our physicality. In the second half, it's almost as if right, we've done that. We've proved that we can match them physically. We don't have to do that anymore. And the second half, we took the tempo up, and we were able to you know use like you were saying, John, think your way around them instead of trying to bludgeon your way through them. And that's what we did in that second half. I thought, I thought it was, it, it was not telling, but I thought it was noticeable that we kind of, we took them both ways. Yeah, well, like I thought it was gonna. I thought we were in for a hiding actually in the first 
20 minutes because we've barely touched the ball. I think we, we made something ridiculous like 46 tackles in, I don't know, 15 minutes, you know, something really that's unsustainable mm. over a, a long period of time. And it was like as though we were just like nearly like um, Muhammad Ali in the rumble in the jungle, rope you know, rope a dope where <laughs> they nearly boxed themselves out. And, you know, we just absorbed, 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 and then hit them. And they had not, it looked like they had nothing left. And obviously they came back. So they did have something left. But um, I, I, I was just when I was thinking, God, this could go horribly wrong for us, particularly after being at the match the night before, when, you know, things I did felt, go horribly wrong. Well, when I felt I had uh, been transported back to 1997. And, uh, you know, Christian Cullen and Frank Bunce and the boys were cutting through us with a, like a knife. Through. Yeah, like a knife through butter. And, um, yeah, it was just, I just thought we were in for another night of thinking maybe the rugby bubble is starting to burst here. And, uh, but, I mean, luckily it didn't. Small margins. Uh, yeah, speaking of that game, there were a few players that, that, uh, that played okay on our side, but they're... The defence, especially out, out wide, was just appalling. Now, sitting beside the pitch there, the, particularly their two wingers, are huge men. There's a lot of huge men, and they're they're huge and they're fast. Uh, but they weren't meeting a whole lot of uh, opposition. There was fellas not quite waving them through, but slapping them on the arse as they went by uh, in, <clears throat> in situations. Um. I was impressed with actually somebody was mentioned to me during the week last week, uh, Lachman, who I never really maybe I had a bit of a Finley Bealham, a Jason Finley Bealham on him, but he, he's really come on. He uh, has, he's come on immensely, yeah. And I'd have to, yeah, he seems to have got ahead of Ed Byrne in terms of well, he was playing the other night, uh, for example. Um, now mm. there obviously that's a game for trying out combinations and trying, you know, but I, I would suggest that he's. He's next in line behind Keane Healy uh, at this stage. And, you know, not with it. Like, there's a few good props out there. There's Dennis Buckley's never got a look in. I don't know whether they feel he's never going to be up to international level. Uh, there's, you know, there's Ed Byrne, obviously. Uh, and there's there's a few others. There's... Um, Eric O'Sullivan. That's who I was thinking of, yeah, up, in, up, in, up the north. And he's had a couple of goals in the Ireland squad. I don't know that he get capped, but he's he's certainly been in the squad. Um, and, you know, there's a lot of, uh, there's, there's a fair bit of talent there. And I would have said Lachman was behind a lot of it until quite recently. And now he's, you know, I don't know what age he is, about 26, 27, is he? Um, so, you know, he, he's a Blackrock college boy back in the day. Went to Munster. Did he go through our academy even? I think he, yeah. did. he did. And then he went to Munster, yeah. Uh, he obviously wasn't getting a contract at the end of his academy and went down to Munster. And fair play to him. He's really, apart from uh, looking like Edward Seventh with his beard, he's uh, he's um, <laughs> he's really uh, he's really come on immensely just in the last season or so. Yeah, uh, he's, he's, he's one of the few players who kind of enhanced their reputation that game. Very, very few did. Mm. Um I thought I thought in fairness to New Zealand, uh, uh, they really did their work on us. You could see they the way they were defend, huh? They wanted it. It was like payback yeah. for the tour. But you could they see really the way that it. they had kind of they th- their defensive line was up hard. It was up fast. Anytime we were trying to do little fold behinds, or, or, or they were straight in on it. Like every time we tried to play kind of a multi phase game, they we were losing ground because they were so hard and fast up on us. Um, I mean, Casey's Casey. People have mixed opinions about him. He's a bit like an Uzi, you know. He shoots a lot of bullets, but they're not always accurate, you know. Um, it, and, and New Zealand targeted him as well. You could see that they targeted his hand or his arm, yeah. Uh, in terms of you know coming come to that new say, that tactic that we've all suddenly noticed about attack, attacking scrum half's arm through the through the rook that's always been there. But anyway. Um, so he he was specifically targeted. They obviously decided slow him down, slow the rook down, get our fellas up fast, and that that's Ireland done, and that's what happened. Well, it's like when when they were when we were attacking, it was like we were hitting a brick wall if we were lucky, uh, <laughs> you know, uh, because 
if we weren't lucky, we were going backwards in in attack. You know, we were taking the ball on on a ten meter line and finishing up on the twenty two in the same attack, just because their their um, their line speed was was so so uh, serious. You know, they were really taking. And if we did hit the gain line, we were getting stopped dead on it. You know, so mm-hmm. it was noticeable that that was happening when we had the ball in the attack and they had the ball in the attack. I don't know what we were doing, but it was uh, it wasn't a brick wall. It was far from a brick wall. Uh, and that's why to, we got that's why we got hammered. It was good to see though. There were one or two, like I said, very few players enhanced the reputation. Lockman was one. I thought Marty Moore was another. Um mm. I thought he looked very good when he came on. He looks to be in 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 some kind of shape. And you know, he's a fantastic I mean Round. That's the kind yeah, of shape. Yeah. <laughs> but I mean he is a fantastic footballer and he's a brilliant scrummager. You know, if we get yeah. Marty Moore back to the Marty Moore he used to be in time for the World Cup. That's a massive thing. Having another tight head prop of that quality, it's huge. Yeah. Even putting pressure on the guys behind him or a bunch of them. Yeah. But like one like I was talking to somebody at the weekend and I was kind of saying I was just basically saying would it not have been a good idea for the IRFU to give in that match to Limerick or Galway or Belfast? And he said, Yeah, yeah, true, but I, your man said, but like um, Farrell said that he wanted all of the squad to train together so that he, because he wanted to be the inverted commas coach of this team and so that they were all in, logistically they all had to be in Dublin that the night before the South Africa game. So that leads me to, to question then, if Farrell was involved in the coaching of that, surely he couldn't split his time in any, you know, couldn't give it enough time so it was almost like hiding to nothing in that, you know, if the fellas are nearly turning up and been, you know, back to kind of Ireland in the 70s where you're you're introducing to each other the night before in the, in the lobby of the hotel nearly, you know, because they're, like, what training would they have done under Farrell? They, would they have been in opposition to the Irish team? You know, so I... I'd, 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 say, I'd say there's an element of that too, Jason, but also, I mean... Because because we know how good some of those players are. I know, admittedly, not playing against a really good, well drilled, motiv- highly motivated New Zealand team. But we know that Hume's a very good player. We know that Casey has loads of potential. Coombs has, you know, done very well for Munster at I was surprised at him actually. European European Cup level. Um Larry's a fine player. You know, like all these guys, and you would say they've done their or in their perception of me and you who rock up to the RDS on a, on a Friday night, in my perception, I'd say, Jesus, their careers have taken a serious dint. But, you know, if, you, if you're going to be honest about it, I'd say, well, they got back all training because, you know, you're, you're only going to, you're going to get out of it what you put into it. And if you're I, not I, been fully... I, I think all the focus had to be on the South Africa game for the obvious yeah, reasons. Yeah, of course so it they, does. So there was going to be, you know... Um, a kind of a deficit in, in terms of time available to those guys. But also, it's not necessarily a bad thing. Farrell can look and see how those guys react mm. to that adversity. And that'll yeah. tell him a lot about them. You know, how how how, how they react on, 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 reacted on Monday in training or Tuesday in training when they were back training with the main squad. You learn a lot about, you, you do learn a lot about players in adversity. I mean, obviously it's better not to have any, but you're going to have some, so you may as well prepare for it. Mm. Yeah, uh, for sure. And Coombs. Coombs, Coombs kind of got a. He's the only player that was named in the uh, full squad that, that got sent his marching orders after that game. Um, he, he, he's back. Like, there's a few of them promoted uh, from, to, the, to the Ireland squad, but he was sent back to Munster. Now, partially, it might be said because of this game against South Africa in uh, Parky Quave. So, you know, it may not be any kind of reflection on him. It may be just they want a number eight for, for their game against uh, the South Africans. Um, I don't know. But, you know, it's just like he didn't have a particularly great game by his admittedly mm-hmm. high standards uh, against New Zealand. Like, I I thought he was a really, really good find from the minute I saw him in Munster. I mean, he broke through very early and he's a lump of a lad who can... You know, he's he, and he's not without skill either. So uh, I, I thought he'd be putting pressure on the Irish team, and I'm surprised mm-hmm. that he's not really. Uh, he has, he should have the talent there. So I don't know. I don't see him in training, and I don't have the eye of uh, 
Well, the, 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 there is that. And there's also the element that he's in. He's in a very populated position. I mean, that's true. There's himself. There's Caelan Doris. There's Jack Conan. There's guys like Max Deegan. There's other guys around the place who are who who who. Are, so, if the if, if the, the 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 thinking for this match, a, it's a game against Fiji. Uh, B, we've enough number eights, and C, Munster have a big game. I mean, those European that, that new European jersey isn't going to sell itself, so they need some big names mm-hmm. down there for that. So, um, yeah, but I'd say I'd say I wouldn't read I wouldn't read anything uh, in, in terms of the national squad into his been released. Um, maybe people might have thought he would have started against Fiji, perhaps, but. Uh, this is obviously, I mean, there's nothing to say that if he, if he plays against South Africa, it comes through and find that he can't come back up to Dublin on, on Friday morning, you know? Mm, two high, high uh, pace test matches in the one weekend. I don't think any player's going to be out. It's not a test weekend. match, John. It's an exhibition you know, game. Well, it's a professional game of rugby. Yeah. And I don't, and it's against like the Springboks who are share a pipe hit and MRFers. So uh, I, I don't think anybody is going to be like, we all know. Professional rugby is like being in a series of car accidents. Um, but it, it is the way Gavin Coombs plays it with with that high high carrying intensity style is. So as well, so yeah. So I don't um, think anyone's going to be asked to back it up two days later. Like no, probably not. Would have been. But I, I don't think it means anything in but, terms of him being out of the squad or anything. I think it's just this is a tactical use of resources. Mm-hmm. Well, we'll see. Wouldn't it be really funny if uh, if we played? Uh, a very very understrength squad against which I'm not suggesting we're going to against Fiji and got beaten and lost our number one ranking just because we, <laughs> <laughs> we couldn't get our act together. Uh, now I, I think I, I the, by the looks of things we're going to have a very strong team out against Fiji. Um, from the chatter, obviously Ty Furlong is going to start anyway because he's yeah. captain. Yeah. Um, I'd I'd say you'll see guys. I'd say Gibson Park. They want to put minutes into Gibson Park. I say they want to put minutes into Hugo Keenan. Um. There's other guys there. I mean, apparently Stuart McCluskey's come through and is available again. I thought he'd broken something the way he was taken off with his arm, kind of sl- yeah. slinged in his jersey. Uh, so guys like that will be available. I think we'll have, actually have a relatively strong squad. Um, I mean, we we haven't played Fiji. I mean, I don't know if you remember it, but the last time we played Fiji was, what, five years ago? Um, mm-hmm. Fairly dreadful game. Joey Carberry got a bad injury. Started that run of injuries that he had mm-hmm. for maybe three or three years. Um and but that was that was that game. Uh, but Ireland, an understrength Ireland team, were fairly comprehensive winners against Fiji. Having said that, Fiji are apparently very very strong. They they they've been going very well this year. Well, they, I mean, I mean they played is unscathed after this one because you can be pretty sure he'll be starting. Yeah. Um. They they played. I, play, I watched them against Scotland. Some of the rugby they played was good, but I mean, at the end of the day, you can't play top level test rugby with 14 players for half an hour or with that's always 14 been, players you know, for 50 minutes. That's always been their Achilles heel, isn't it? Yeah. Just their indiscipline and the high tackles. It's it's like oh, every, well, practically you have to see Italy giving away stupid penalties, but getting yellow cards in the Six Nations. And, you know, they're already playing with a one hand behind their back, but if you you know if you're gonna if you're gonna only have um, fourteen men on the pitch, you you've got really no chance. Um, Italy were playing Italy. So just just as you mentioned, Italy were playing Samoa, and yeah. uh, I thought that game would be very very close. I thought Samoa might even edge it because they're preparing for a World Cup. Italy took them to pieces. Mm. Yeah, poor Al- Al- Alatoa didn't have a. Yeah. Well, I didn't see the game, but. Uh... Oh, Italy got Italy shredded them. Italy generally have a good scrum too. Yeah, yeah. There was a couple of just before we move on to the next week's match. Why don't we just briefly look at the other um, matches from last weekend? So, so France uh, narrowly beat Australia thirty points to twenty nine. Um, world lovely, try, world France try, try yeah. from Australia there. Did you yeah. see that one? Yeah, it was from it was from their own try line. It was just like France in the nineties, uh, who were beaten with their own tactics. Uh, I, I thought it was an amazing looking try, and it just shows how strong Australia are if they can run France that close uh, yeah. in their home backyard. Yeah, and like I suppose, like they're obviously we know how hard um, they're being hit by the NRL, but. 
because there's so many massive athletes from the NRL, they have a good, you know what I mean? Like they just have to go and take two or three of them and bring them into the union side. And they've got three absolutely world-class players really, practically ready-made for them. So um, the other game of the weekend, one that was on when I was just in the stadium was uh, Wales against New Zealand. Like it, they looked like it was going to be close for a while and then New Zealand just pulled away from them and um, beat them fairly comprehensively. 55-23 in the end. Mm. Wales, Wales, you look at the, the Welsh team and you look at the names on it and you think, oh, those are really good. But they're kind of, they're at a point in their careers where the spirit is willing, but the flesh is not as not what it once was. I'm talking about guys like Alan Wynne jones maybe uh, George North, uh, Dan Bigger's injured, Reese Priestland is, he is what he is. Um, they, have, they have great, they have great attacking wingers. And great finishers, but I'm not sure that they have the pack or the centers to get the ball into their hands anymore. No, I agree. And uh, a little side uh, side thing from that uh, game: uh, Sam Whitelock is within is it 15 caps of Alan Wynne Jones. Now people are saying nobody's ever going to catch Alan Wynne Jones, and uh, you know maybe they won't uh, because Sam Whitelock is two years younger. Uh, however, the way World Cup cycles go, you just kind of fancy both of them are going to make the World Cup, and maybe not. Uh, Alan Wynne Jones has to really retire after the World Cup. I mean, he's it's caused him to go now. He's older than uh, than, than Johnny Sexton, I think, or he's around at least. If, if he's not, he's very very close. I saw some. Uh, I saw some uh, comments on Twitter that's uh, a year older, nearly a year old. There's this kind of. The tide is starting to turn against them and saying thanks so much for all of the all the years, but it's time to go. So, yeah, I think well, I think I think I think he still has a World Cup in him, um, but I'm just not sure he has a World Cup in him as the great Alan Wynne Jones that we that we've seen for the last you know 10, 15 years. Um, but he's still a great player. I mean, he 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 will always be a great player. Um, mm-hmm. It's as simple as that. Of course. Um, but Wales, just, Wales, Wales, Wales weren't at the level New Zealand were at. New Zealand were just much, much better. And the Barrett, the Barrett, the the two back Barrett brothers—that's hard to say—were um, superb. Yeah, it's a, it's just I just mentioned it in passing as a, an interesting sidebar. Uh, whether whether Sam Whitelock ever catches him or anybody, you know, people have said nobody will ever get that amount of Test caps. Uh, again, I don't know, but uh, if anybody will, it'll be Sam Whitelock in the same position. Um, so England were beaten at home by the RGs again, sent in the yeah. scoreline to France, Australia. Um, there was one piece of, of uh, play from Argentina, but I think more notably was uh, Newell's almost refusal to chase back. And I don't know whether you've seen it. He just he just literally gives up. The ball is turned over on the in the Argentinian twenty two. Guy makes a break and he just stops. Like and it's only the other winger comes in who makes an effort to get back, but uh, very very poor. Like I'm sure it's going to be highlighted, but again, a lot of criticism of the Welsh coach after their performance against New Zealand. A lot of pressure under Jones now. The knives are getting sharpened. Well, it's hard to see anyone changing their coach ten months out from a World Cup, but uh, uh, can we say Eddie's lost the dressing room? I don't. Th- I don't think so. I mean, Jones has always been fair. I mean, he's always been fairly clear that everything that happens for, and he, he's been saying this for the last two years. Everything that happens over the next two years doesn't matter. It's all about the World Cup. So he's built. He's built up that kind of, if you like, defensive barrier in front of him. Um, that people are going to give him to the World Cup, but they better have a good World Cup because they better. But they like they're like, you know, there's. Because they've sacrificed getting, two years of rugby to get to it, is, is what I mean. People, but people are getting dis like it's no different than in Ireland. Like the Six Nations is still a very, very meaningful competition to mm. England. It's where they make all of their money from. Like there's people now in England are saying the atmosphere is crap. We're losing matches at home, whereas before, you know, they're not used to losing matches at home. They're you know, there's people saying, I'm not prepared to spend 100, 150 quid on a ticket not to win, 
to be to be watching rubbish rugby and for the atmosphere to be like you know something that the air has been sucked out in right so you know if all of a sudden if there's people the same well i'm not prepared to there's a cost of living crisis it's probably worse in england than it is over here do you know what i mean like people start if there's green seats all around twicken and not been filled eddie's out yeah, well, I mean, I, I don't think that, I mean, okay, they've got, you've got the, whatever, two more in, in, autumn internationals, and then the Six Nations is going to be full anyway. It doesn't matter how good or bad they are. Six Nations is going to be full. Um, and then you're into the World Cup, and that's, all he has to do is is is, is, is get through the Six Nations semi-intact. I mean, I don't think England are expected to have a brilliant Six Nations because they're away to Ireland. Um, it's So they, 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 they do, they, they won't, that won't, the 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 Twickenham denizens won't see England lose to Ireland, perhaps, right? So I mean, they're not expected to. Have, the, it's not considered to be a Grand Slam year for England. Mm. You know the way because you know the way when we're going for the champion, we always want to have England and France. Yeah, at home. yeah, but, but yeah. like, and England have the opposite kind of fixture list this year. It's a bad year for them, if you like. Yeah, well, you know, it, I, I'm sure I'm probably over egging it a little bit, but at the same time, the they do have like they have very very high standards. They've they're the only Northern Hemisphere team to to win the World Cup. They were in last the last final, you know. They've got umpteen grand. Like it's a poor season for them if they don't win the championship. Whereas yeah, we, no, I'm, I'm not we, saying we used not, we used to be happy. We used to be happy to say oh if we win our two home games, yeah, you know, it wasn't that long ago that was a successful season. Yeah, no, I'm never, not talking. That was I'm, never I'm, success for England. I'm not saying he's he's bulletproof. Um, I mean, he can't afford to finish bottom of the Six Nations or you know second bottom of the Six Nations. That's that's not what I'm saying. But what I'm saying is the expectation he has managed expectation to the point where the Six Nations isn't as important in to the to the RFU as the World Cup is this year. Yeah. Well, anyway, so we kind of touched on Munster's match against South Africa, like. You have to say, pretty impressive. Forty-one thousand tickets sold for play to them. Oh, before we actually leave last week's matches, what did you think of the piped-in music every time the ball went out of play? Disaster. It was like being in the southern hemisphere. I wasn't there, so. <laughs> Although I did, I, I mean, okay, you can do stuff like, say, for example, when a try is scored, you can play some music. When the water, the, you know, the official water breaks play some music but you don't need to do it every time people are packed getting ready for a scrum or there's a, an injury break you don't need to do it and if you're going to do it what you, do, you don't do is you don't just put on a record and walk off you pick you fill it bits of songs to, to pay yeah. to play the most up tempo part like for example and, and it's no criticism of the song singer band or song but they played uh, dreams by by the cranberries right at one point during one of the water breaks and the bit they started on was you know that kind of there's that vocal break in the song where 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 Dolores sings that kind of a it's a pure almost it's not a word thing it's she's just singing she's it's kind of tone music and that doesn't work in a stadium that's not you if you're going to do it you pick the chorus start on the bloody mm -hmm. chorus it was badly planned I know why they're trying to do it I think it's a I think it's a stupid idea anyway but I know why they're trying to do it and if you but if you're going to do it do it right but there was there was one, there was a, there was a few moments that was even worse than the music like I can almost tolerate the music. And, and, but exactly as you say, play it at the right time. Play the catchy part of a chorus yeah. rather than the intro. The fillers the, of the music. Yeah, exactly. But there was one part at the uh, when we arrived in. They had, I think, now I'm not really too familiar with them, but there's Dermot and Dave. It was one of those two. I heard about that. And he started, you know, shouting into the microphone, "Come on, Ireland! Come on, Ireland!" I was like, "Oh my God! Please tell him to stop! Please tell him to stop!" And this was maybe 15 was he minutes. having a Delia Smith moment? It wasn't far off, and I was actually thinking he was having a breakdown. But it was, um, I was just terribly cringy, and like it was almost pleading with the crowd. No, and then it was, you know, the very start of the match. They he started off like a thirteen, counting down to the kickoff. Like you know what I mean? Like I mean, it was fifteen actually. I, I think it was fifteen because. They had all the players on the big screen and the back, you know, their numbers on the jerseys. Like, start at three and go, you know what I mean? Like, if you're going to do it, do it sort of that people can just join in instead of this elongated 
countdown. Like anyway, um, the, the, the there have been criticisms. There have been criticisms of the Aviva atmosphere and uh, various different the way people get up and get down, sit down for strings. Blah, blah, blah. Anyway, the problem. It's not the stadium that's responsible for the atmosphere. It's the people in it. And yeah. people, if you remember, if you can think of any of the really good games you've been to in the, in the Aviva, the atmosphere has been brilliant because the game is yeah. good. The crowd Perfect. feeds off what's on the pitch and then you get that kind Perfect. of st- circular flow. If, if it's a crap game, you're going to have a crap atmosphere. If it's a good game, like the atmosphere, certainly mm-hmm. from what I was watching on TV, the atmosphere seemed to be absolutely rocking because and it was such a great game. And because there was three points in it. Yeah. Like last year, last year I went to the Scotland game. I'm sure probably before even matches kicked off, we knew Ireland were going to beat Scotland. Do you know? And so, and like, because and then all of a sudden people start murmuring amongst themselves because there's no, there's not, it's not kind of, it's nothing. Can, uh, can I use my word of the season? Jeopardy. Yes. There's no yes. jeopardy. <laughs> Correct. Whereas, you know, the All Black game last, last year and indeed in uh, 2018, you were sitting on the edge of your seats because it was so tense and, and close. And like like last week's game, you know, there's three points in it. We were, I wouldn't say we were hanging on by our fingertips, but we were certainly, we weren't comfortable until the ball was kicked out of the, of the, of the pitch by Carberry. Now, I, 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 obviously, I, as I said before, I wasn't there, but looking at it on television, it seemed to me that with the exception of the water break, they toned it down a lot in the second half. Yeah. That would was that was that your perception of it? Um, possibly, but I because think because they were getting um, slaughtered on social media, absolutely yeah. slaughtered on social media because of it during the game. Yeah. But I, I think that, like, if they're going to introduce it, it's going to take it'll have teething problems. Like, it was even worse the night before in the RDS because it almost you could That's hear the fluff, you could hear the fluff on the stylus almost. Um, <laughs> As as the the record was going right now, obviously I'm, I'm exaggerating, but but like it was it was much more haphazardly done at the RDS. So I I don't I'm not I'm not against it per se, but uh, stop with the shouting of the the DJ before the match, and you know make think them, about make it, it more make, exactly and make it more kind of condensed into just the hardcore few bars of the song. It's, Exactly. For us as rugby fans, right, the, the classic example of music used in a match is when New Zealand used to score a try, they played I Got You by the, by Split Ends. Right. But they only played the course because the bit that leads up to the course, it's a great song and they're a great band and the Finns are great songwriters. But the bit that leads up to the chorus is actually, you know, it's not really dancey music. It's when the chorus kicks in. That's why they always played the chorus. And mm-hmm. so you've got to be choosy about what you play and choosy about the parts you play. So you really should prepare this. Not, not I mean, I, I, I thought it was poorly executed rather than a poor idea. Yeah. Anyway, I, so the jury's out, I say. So anyway, I just wanted the to... The jukebox it. jury is out. <laughs> yeah, there you go. Perfect. So uh, we play Fiji at the weekend. You, you said that um, Ty Furlong was an Ensis captain, which is interesting to see. I saw, I saw an article or an interview with him in the 42... And he seemed to be almost raising both his eyebrows to kind of go, I'm not really sure what to do here as captain. Like, what do I say? I'd, what do I do if I only play 50 or 60 minutes? And like, you know, I'm in my day. I'm to somebody else is what you do. Um, and he says um, he captained the team when he was under 18. And in those days it was banging tables and kicking doors and all that sort of thing, you know. Um, so he was good at so that. I'm sure he was, but... Uh, you know, it'd be interesting to see how he goes, and probably is more recognition of of the man himself than. But it obviously he, means he, that Sexton's not playing. But like we knew that anyway. Yeah. His his press conference was certainly less anodyne than one normally sees in these. Um, he was he's like, um, I never dreamed a captain in Ireland when I was a young fella. And somebody asked him what he did dream of. <laughs> he's like <laughs> sports, <laughs> great. <laughs> <laughs> My mom's roast, yeah, brilliant, brilliant line. So, I mean, it's, it's obviously going to be a more interesting period. Uh, you're not going to get the 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 dull type of interview from him, but uh, no, I, I'm delighted for him. He's, he's he's been a great he's a great player for Ireland. So, you know, get this under his belt. I mean, he's only played two halves of rugby this year, uh, or this season. So, you know, get some rugby under him. Um, mm. Say, I'd say the same for Gibson Park, same for Hugo Keenan, same for a couple of the other guys. Um, set it all up. Make sure everybody comes into that Australia game. All forty guys or whatever in the squad go into that Australia game, absolutely tipping over. 
Well, I, I think I said it a, a couple of weeks ago. I'm not sure if it was last week or I think it was a few weeks ago where uh, basically this is our, our uh, you know, it's it's great the way that games are aligned, that we've got big hard test first, get, get in, do the business. And then we've got a second, we've got both the New Zealand game um, and maybe to some degree even the game against South Africa with Munster um, as and the Fiji game as a kind of an audition for the next act, which is Australia, uh, who are not to be taken lightly, as we've just seen at the weekend. Um, with Isn't Dave Rennie still coaching them? Um, mm -hmm. So I'd say they could give us a bit of a, a brown trouser moment. So, uh, you know, we need to have our best players uh, and what better way of discovering them than, than having so many you know three high level games to test players out in um and see see who's left standing after it i think that's that's going to benefit us hugely uh, and we're, you know it's going to be all guns blazing like you said there'll probably be a few guns blazing this weekend for fiji uh looks like we're going to name a fairly hot team but isn't it great that we have you know the way the games fell that we had an A match and a and a South Africa game, and then we've got a, a Munster game and a Fiji game, uh, and then we've got you know it's it's just it's fallen very well for us. Or well, I, I don't I don't know who's in charge of scheduling in the IIFU, but they've done a great job this year. Certainly in terms of you know, there's always been that thing about Irish teams going into World Cups maybe been undercooked or whatever. Mm -hmm. We're playing a lot of really good games this season. I mean, we started off with New Zealand tour. We have, uh, this is just purely from an Ireland point of view. We had the New Zealand tour with the with the two extra matches. We had the Emerging Ireland tour with those three games. We have this autumn international period. Then we've got the Six Nations. So the players are constantly in and around the Ireland camp. They're not, there's no huge break where they're, they're not going to see the Irish coaches for six months. It's it's actually going to be fairly continuous leading into the World Cup. It, it seems to be, I've always, I, I, as you know, I've always questioned the the amount of uh, intent the IRFU have as regards the World Cup. You can't question it this year. This year, mm. it's it's very obviously that the whole season has been designed around delivering a team to that World Cup in good condition and ready to to make a, a significant challenge. Yeah, mm -hmm. but like you see, you see the benefits. Like they sold out this game and it was sold out a week in advance. You know, it's, it's I wouldn't say it's unusual, but it's not the it norm is. that the the Hmm? Selling out a Fiji game in Lansdowne Road is unusual. I would have yeah. said, yeah, very yeah. unusual. Sorry, that's so sort of immense. That um, they, but they've they've obviously, but it means that if the if the national team is successful, these fringe games become sellouts, and they can charge top whack. I mean, like the tickets aren't cheap for, for this. Like when I initially saw how much I had to pay for it, I was like, Jesus Christ, for the Fiji game. Do you know what I mean? It's it's, it's uh, I think it was 80 quid, I think my ticket was. You know what I mean? They're, like, they're not. Whereas maybe five years ago, maybe 10 years ago, the midweek, the, the mid game that against the sort of lesser, lesser nation team would have been a lot cheaper for the regular punter. Like, it's so to, to get, they managed to get it away, but they've also got the revenue for it now, which probably the same revenue that they would receive for maybe the, the Scotland match. Only five years ago, so yeah, and and, and as well, I mean, they, they in fairness, they took a big risk with the with the scheduling in a way, because if they'd lost that South Africa game, there would have been a the, there would have been a depression, a depressing effect on ticket sales for Fiji. But because yeah. they won it, everybody wants to be associated with winners, you know. And that's fair yeah. enough. That's how it goes. So I mean, it's it, it's worked out very very well for them. Absolutely, yeah. So yeah, so so um, like there obviously that that emphasis and maybe after the last few years of COVID, where the coffers have been down to the bone a little bit, that they that, that national team has to be successful because that's what brings the money in. Yeah. And um, just turning back to the team, like interesting to see that uh, Jack Crowley has, like Frawley again, has managed to get himself injured. He got injured against uh, New Zealand. Just every time he seems to be pushing his nose in front he seems to pick up an injury. And now Crowley, um, sorry, Crowley has been subbed up into the into the team. So you might see him coming in, whether it's at out half or fullback. Um, you know, I don't know whether they're going to give more time more game time to, to Hugo Keenan. Like he's got why why rush him back, I'd say. Mm. 
Yeah, I'd, I'd say Crowley will be on the bench at 22, and, and whether we need a fullback or an out half, he'll be it. Um, you know, it's good to see him. I mean, he looks like a potentially good, a bit of a bang of Raj off him in some ways. Um, he, I was very he, surprised at how big he is mm. when he came on. I thought like he had a pretty good game when he came on um, in that A game, but I was surprised to see his stature. He's actually a big man. He's yeah. a good bit smaller than Frawley, but Frawley's very big. Well, I, I stood beside Frawley in um, the Beggar's Bush with you, John, the other night, and tell you what, he's as tall as I am. He's like a really big man for uh, for an out half. Um, like the the size of these players now is phenomenal. Like Dan Sheehan, I stood beside him after the Munster Munster game in the Aviva, and again he's for a hooker. He's as tall as I am, and I used to play in the second row. You know, like well, he, was, he might have played in the second row forty years ago. You know, <laughs> uh, <laughs> forty years ago might be a little bit exaggerated, but um, uh. Yeah, they're they're huge guys. Um, they they, they really are. Uh, well, the population's getting bigger anyway. Um, but we were talking last week about visibility, about the benefits of it and the detriment to it. Um, unfortunately for Frawley, he's not going to get an opportunity to be visible because he's injured. Mm-hmm. Whereas Crowley gets that chance because he, yeah. he he's he's there, you know. And the coaches get to have a look at him. And, and and he steps it up. It's like it's like Jimmy O'Brien as well. All of a sudden, Jimmy O'Brien hasn't been talked about as been somebody who'll be in the B squad, if you for want of a better phrase. Jimmy O'Brien has been talked about now as one of the one of the if you like would say twenty six. Mm-hmm. Maybe, maybe he might he mightn't strip every match, but he's he's certainly one of the guys who's considered a part of the A team as such. So he's um, an ideal. He's an ideal number twenty three. Yeah, he can cover is, the yeah. whole back five of the uh, on the pitch, you know. You can cover yeah. both centers and and all three back three players uh, positions. Leinster started him at out half two years ago, didn't they? It didn't go so well, I remember, but he has started at out half for Leinster. I think he might have played out half in school too. Yeah, um, but he, yeah, he's he can slot in. I think when he started in the academy, he was seen as a thirteen, and then all his early caps were seemed to be at full back, and he might have had a couple in the center. Um, and you know he can also play. He's fast enough to play in the wing, so he's an ideal twenty-three. I mean that mm-hmm. bit of versatility gets you into squads. Uh, you do need to nail down a position to get into teams, but you know he's he's certainly uh, like we're all of a sudden how like Stockdale for example is is gone home, um, or he's not gone home, but he's he's uh, was in the A squad. Um, where uh, Jimmy O'Brien was subbed up uh, to replace uh, Stuart, uh, Stuart, what's his name, on the bench when Robbie yeah. Henshaw went out. Uh, you know, they could have easily brought Stockdale up, a proven quality, mm-hmm. a match winner at t- the top level, you know, but they brought yeah. up Jimmy O'Brien. That's That says a lot. Versatility. Uh, and you'd have to think that, you know, uh, be, uh, apart from James Lowe, you would have said a year ago that Stockdale is the man in the number eleven jersey. You know, all of a sudden you've Mike Hansen, you've you've obviously James Lowe to come back from injury. You've got Balakun now on the other wing, and Jimmy O'Brien coming in, who can who's going to play in the back three probably as well. So there's just... and, and remember two two uh, stalwarts, um, if fit. Are unavailable in in Earls and uh, Andrew Conway. Yeah. Yeah. So I mean, there are. I mean, there is a lot of strength there. I mean, in a way, I feel sorry for Stockdale. Just as he reached the peak and was going was had hit his peak, he just got that injury, and it's been a struggle for him ever since. But that happens to players sometimes. Sometimes after a bad injury, it can take two or three years to get back to where they were. Mm -hmm. But the good ones do get back, and I've no doubt he will. Yeah. Mm Just one thing that reminded of them, um, apparently when, when Issa was going, he was asked which kids coming through is going to be, which is going to, is going to make it. And he said, Jimmy O'Brien. So obviously a good man for spotting a bit of talent. And um, before we go, just, just one little bit of Leinster news, just in relation to the redevelopment of the stadium. Mm-hmm. Uh, interesting to read today in the Irish Times that um, the church behind the grandstand, St. Mary's Church, was bought by the RDS with the specific purpose of um, 
having extra space for the, now they can't knock it down, but they can repurpose it. So maybe have some sort of catering or, yeah, or whatever. On the, on, the, on the triangle between the Anglesey and the yeah. St. George Road, yeah? Yeah. yeah. Uh, they're talking about using it for, as an event space or as you say for 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 uh for uh, what you call it for uh, uh, um, catering. selling food and stuff like that yeah but uh, what they the really want, yeah what they really want is the land <laughs> and that's what they got um yeah. it gives four them million that whole, they paid. pardon four million they paid yeah well the, the, I mean yeah, I think that's I think it was originally put on market at 3.75 so they haven't exactly paid over the odds so mm -hmm. um but they have that entire block now um and it gives them a lot more flexibility in terms of how they redesign the offering as people call yeah. it these days well I mean as we we mentioned there a couple of weeks ago the, the obviously the Leinster rugby and the RDS have come to an arrangement for the next 25 years so they Presumably, they can't continue in its current guise for more than a few more years. It has to be properly redeveloped. And uh, obviously, this is part of the phasing that's going to, that they're going to need to get it in place, which is good to see. Mm. Yeah. And before we go, I just want to obviously pay tribute to Paul McNaughton. Um, you know, very sadly passed like he was an amazing sportsman, uh, played obviously rugby for Ireland, Leinster rugby, but he played soccer for, uh, in the League of Ireland. He played, I think he played schoolboy soccer, uh, international. He played GA for Wicklow, a stalwart of, of Greystones Rugby Club. And um, very sad to see, he obviously was manager of, of Leinster and, our, and Ireland. And uh, very sad to see him pass uh, this week. Yeah, yeah he, only he's, 69. Yeah, young, young. Not only is he a huge loss to, to rugby at Leinster, he's a huge loss to sport in the province. Um, as you say, he played foot, played soccer and played Gaelic football at the highest levels. Um and you know, to it's one thing to be a top player, and it's another thing to be a top administrator. When I say administrator, I mean obviously I mean that in the most positive sense of the word. To be both is is, is highly unusual. Um to have played for and managed the province to have played for and managed his country. Exceptional. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Very sad. Well, rest in peace. And we wish all his friends and family um, and our thoughts and prayers, as they say. But anyway, boys, as ever, thanks very much. Thanks very much for watching. If you are following us, uh, give us a like, a subscription on Facebook and Twitter. Cheers.